question. I now recognize the chair of the Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism, and Homeland Security, the gentlelady from California, Ms. Bass, for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I want to thank you for your years of leadership on this issue. I know you've been involved for many years supporting police reform. And I want to thank you for convening this hearing today. What we saw in Minnesota, the slow, torturous murder of George Floyd by a uniform officer was an outrage and a tragedy. <laughs> what we have seen since then, millions of Americans marching in the street to demand justice and call for reforms. It has been an inspiration. And minus a few days of violence, it has been peaceful and it has been in the American tradition. And what we have here today is a hearing in the US Congress to examine policing practices in America and paths to reform. And so we have an opportunity. What we have seen since then is an opportunity to rethink the nature of policing, an opportunity for meaningful accountability in policing. And it is an opportunity to show the nation and the world that we are listening and that we will act. Too often this debate is framed in terms of citizens versus the police, us versus them, but this is really about the kind of America we all want to see. We all want to be safe in our communities. We all want the police to come to our rescue when we're in trouble. We all want to support the brave men and women who put their lives on the line for us every day. And when we interact with police, we all want to be treated with respect, not suspicion. Nobody should be subjected to harassment or excessive force just because of the color of their skin, and no one should suffer the indignities of racial profiling or be on the end of a deadly chokehold. We should all want for ourselves and for our children and for our neighbors the same. On Monday, I introduced, along with Chairman Nadler and more than 200 members of Congress, H.R. 7120, the Justice and Policing Act. This bold, transformative legislation would help reimagine the culture of policing while holding accountable those officers who fail to uphold the ethic of serving and protecting their communities. I know later, when we do a markup, there'll be an inter we will entertain an amendment to change the name of the legislation in honor of George Floyd. If this, if this had been a law last year, George Floyd would be alive because chokeholds would be banned. Breonna Taylor would be alive because no knock warrants for drugs would be banned. Tamir Rice would have graduated high school this May because he, the officer that killed him, had been fired from a nearby department and he lied on his application. But this legislation calls for a national registry so that would not have happened and Tamir Rice would have graduated high school. I understand that change is difficult, but I am certain that police officers are professionals who risk their lives every day and they're just as interested in building a strong relationship with the communities that they serve based on mutual trust and respect as those who rely on their protection are. They want to increase and, and uh, upgrade the profession, and so having national standards, it should never be that you can do a chokehold in one city and not in another. There should be basic standards, there should be basic accreditation, there should be continuing education, just as there are in so many other professions. When I was at the service yesterday, and when I was there, I looked up at the picture of George Floyd, and I, I saw the year that he was born. He was born in 1973. And that was an important year in my life because that was the year in Los Angeles that I joined an organization called the Coalition Against Police Abuse. That was 47 years ago. Our police chief at the time, we were suffering from a number of victims who had died because of chokeholds. Our police chief held a press conference where he told Los Angeles that the reason why black people died of chokeholds was because our neck veins were different. They didn't open up as rapidly as normal people. That's where we were 47 years ago. The question remains for us though, it was 29 years ago that we saw the Rodney King beating. And as an activist at the time, I was sad at the tragedy. It was horrific to see him beat like that. But most of the activists said, finally, finally, we know we'll have justice. There's no way these police officers are gonna get off because the whole world saw what happened. In the civil rights movement, what led to the great change in the end of legal segregation, aside from the tens of thousands of people that protested, it was the fact that there were cameras there. The, the beatings, the treatment of black people in the South had gone on for, frankly, hundreds of years, but it wasn't until those cameras exposed that 
that then things began to change. And so what has happened in the 29 years since Rodney King with the advent of cell phone cameras? We have seen example after example after example. 29 years since Rodney King, 20 years since Amadou Diallo, six years since Eric Gardner, just weeks since the death of George Floyd. His death cannot be in vain. I told his brother that his name will live on in history because the tragedy that he suffered has been the catalyst for what I believe will be profound change. And not just change that helps to professionalize police departments, not just change that prevents further abuse and deaths, but an opportunity for communities through receiving grants to take a look at their community and say, well, there's all of these issues that we face. Why should police officers have to address homelessness and mental illness? Police officers complain all the time. They're not social workers. That's right. So with these grants, maybe communities can take an opportunity to re-envision what public safety is and come up with models, better models to work with police, better models to reduce the problems that wind up needing a police officer. So that's what we have an opportunity to do in this Congress with this piece of legislation. And I hope that we work for passage of this legislation in the House, it gets through the Senate, the President signs it, and in the year 2020, we never, ever, ever see again what we saw a few weeks ago. It wasn't just a tragedy for our country and our nation but it really was an embarrassment of our nation in front of the entire world. While we hold up human rights in the world, we obviously have to hold them up in our country. And with that, 